Good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome. I hope you're well fed and caffeinated. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to today's Swiss Polar Day. My name is Gabriella Schettmann Strub. I'm the current scientific director of the Swiss Polar Institute. But without further ado, I would like to welcome the representative from our host institution, Hugues Apriel, from the University of Bern. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. So uh, first, I'll tell you, I'm surprised to see how many you are. So uh, I don't know much about uh, the Swiss Polar Institute. I've been briefed a little bit, but uh, knowing that you know you are filling uh, like a room like this, plus uh, I've heard uh, 60 about uh, uh, people you know attending pot potentially as via Zoom. Um, it, it's a good surprise. Good. Welcome uh, to the University of Bern. Uh, welcome for this day. Uh, and welcome also to the people that are attending online. So um, the University of Bern, you know it, uh, it's one of the 10 uh, continental Swiss universities. And um, so um, there is a bit of a competition and you know, the, 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 here it's not about that. It's more about you know, what makes you, the University of Bern a bit different. What is our profile? What is our uh, history at the University of Bern? So um, we are, you know, pretty large university, 27,000 uh, students, employees, and, and scientists. And we have our, as I said, history. So I don't have to remind you that, you know, uh, a university in science is done by people, by scientists. And uh, here uh, at the University of Bern, we are proud of one of our former scientists, uh, Professor Hans Hötzger, uh, who was professor, and I was told he was teaching in this room physics uh, many, many years ago. I don't know if some one of you have been a, a physics students here uh, with Hans Oestker. Um, that being said, well, you know about his pioneer work uh, that he has done on, on the measurement techniques and modeling, you know, the Earth's system. Um, related to your day and, you know, Paul, Swiss Polar uh, Institute, I um, can remind you that uh, Professor Hötzger is also considered as one of the you know, grandfathers of these ice core research that performed, he performed, Greenland and Antarctica. And he started with this research in the 1960s, where uh, many of you were not yet born. Um, then he was, at that time, looking at uh, different focus, was more greenhouse gases, of all to uh, you know, reconstruct and model uh, these effects. This area is still uh, one of the focus uh, here at the University of Bern. It has been wider, but um, this is, you know, uh, we have, from what I understand, world experts in the room. So um, what we maybe less know about Hans Oetschger is that, in fact, he started or he done also the, these core uh, ice measurements, drilling um, in the altitude. Am I correct when you say there are three poles that uh, the, 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 the north and the south poles and the third is, well, you know, those mountains that we see here? Okay, so I, I, I interpreted correctly. Good, and he was doing also this kind of work in altitude and in Montrose archives. So uh, for our university, so this history, this background led us to uh, have a NCCR, the NCCR Climate, uh, that has been funded uh, by the Swiss National Science Foundation from 2001 till 2013, um, leading house University of Bern. And this has then become a, uh, one of our strategic centers, uh, the Oetschger Center for Climate Change Research. Um, one of the flagship centers that we have at the University of Bern. So this is also this history that has made um, uh, in 2016, you know, us joining force with other institutions to um, found the Swiss Polar Institute. So we are happy about that. I see that, you know, it attracts a lot of people. It's, I'm sure there is a lot of extremely fascinating science done. Um, here with you. Also understand that this science is getting wider and wider. I mean, medical aspects maybe are coming uh, into place maybe in the future too. So let me wish you a wonderful day here, uh, here in Bern. 
and uh, all the best uh, to the Swiss Polar Institute. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as you mentioned, it's really important to broaden the aspects that are facilitated by the Swiss Polar Institute, uh, especially also considering uh, life sciences and molecular medicine. That would be really wonderful aspects to further include. And for sure, we'll need the university uh, support from Bern also in the future. Definitely. Thank you very much also for hosting us today. Yeah, dear colleagues. Um, here we go. Uh, it's really the aim of today. Actually, we have three aims of today. Uh, and one of them is really to update you on the news and opportunities offered by the Swiss Polar Institute. The second aim of today is really to show you how we open doors for your research. And specifically for today, we have invited Josephine Nyman from the Greenlandic Research Institute. She will be online in the afternoon to elaborate on access options to Greenland. And these things are only possible because we are working on, on memorandum of understandings that uh, support your access uh, to other research stations, to vessels and so on. And finally, I think very important, the third point, we want to inspire you with topics that are outside of your usual, usual business through talks, having you speak, not us speak, and also providing you a platform throughout the day to network. Hence, I give you herewith a free ticket to talk to everybody in this room uh, who you find interesting. And this is especially true for early career researchers. I really urge you to just walk up to people, talk about your research, ask what they're doing. Uh, it's really a networking day. We should not end up talking only in our usual groups, but really exchange and develop new ideas. You know, what does it mean for me going to Greenland? Maybe that's a research opportunity that would be opening up new horizons. So after introducing these three aims of today, I will briefly present uh, some news and opportunities from SBI and also briefly say what we have worked on since the last Swiss holiday uh, in, in uh, kind of what were the main topics we were working on. So we really want to increase the international SBI footprint to support the international access for you, for your collaborations. So we are uh, developing new memorandum of understandings and some of them are uh, bilateral, for example, in the framework of the Connie Stephan grant. You'll hear more about that this afternoon, but also we are really active in multilateral collaborations, especially uh, where we are collaborating with research operators. And this is the European Polar Board, but also the Forum for Arctic Research Operators listed here where Danielle is now in the executive committee. Of course, you have heard about the launch of the flagships, Pamir Greenfjord. I'll not go into more details here. And then finally, um, something you might not see so much is that we, of course, need to apply for funding every four years. And even so, we just uh, became a Swiss national research infrastructure last year. We already need to think about the next four funding years, which means that ne we need to sit down and think about the strategy and priorities for 2025 to 2028. Going briefly into the opportunities, I wanted to present you what calls are currently open. The exploratory grant is now 75,000 francs to kickstart new collaborations or undertake field work. You see potential funding uh, for your activities and the proposal deadline is on 19th of October. So you're still in time if you decide today to write up a research proposal. Similar techno grant, 70, 75,000 francs. This is really for technology development, also including, for example, the private sector. Again, the deadline is 19th of October. And these calls are really recurring. You know, every year we have them. You can apply now or in a year from now. Facilitation of access to international polar research infrastructure and expeditions. Uh, so some, some main activities there, uh, really, we want to provide uh, through MOUs this access. We do have one with the Antarctic uh, Division, Australia, and I'll come back to that Mertz Fellowship just in a few slides further. Uh, there is an existing MOU with the Centre d'Etudes Nordiques, which we want to expand to more um, uh, partners in Canada. And then we are finalizing the Greenlandic one 
uh, MOU with Japan and IPEF, and also with Germany with the Alfred Wegener Institute. So if you want to collaborate with any of these entities, feel free to contact us, ask us how we can help you to facilitate access to their research infrastructure. Uh, we also support international opportunities, such as mounting some sensors on the Vendée Globe that will uh, collect data for some of the researchers here in this room. Feel free to talk to some Shakar if you want to more, know more about the plans, what will be mounted on Oliver Hare's uh, sailing boat. And also, this is a call for you. If you see any upcoming opportunity, something that is ongoing internationally, and you want to join in these ongoing efforts, let us know. Maybe we can facilitate and support these activities. And then finally, we, of course, are really collaborating in international research, infrastructure coordination, as I uh, mentioned before. If you have questions again here, feel free, come back and ask us. Now, the uh, early career researchers are, of course, also specifically supported. We do have the Polar Access Fund. This is a well-known instrument. Uh, and the next call will open in November with a deadline in January. So if you plan to do some field work as an early career researcher, uh, apply. We do still have the field and summer school list uh, where you can select a summer school and suggest to SPA that you get funded for the summer school. And finally, the uh, events that we are organizing. I mentioned the Mertz Fellowship. Maybe some of you have seen it on Twitter yesterday. This is really something new that we developed together with the um, uh, EDA, so with the Foreign Department of Switzerland, specifically with the embassy in Australia. And it's a small fellowship that will allow either an Australian researcher to visit a Swiss institute that does polar research or a Swiss person uh, going to Australia for a short exchange visit. So again, here, please, if you have great ideas, some collaboration you want to establish with Australia in polar research, contact us contact uh, directly the contacts on the website um, and develop your ideas. We really hope that we will have some response to this because this could also really strengthen this collaboration between AID and the Swiss community. Health and safety courses, uh, the next one will be soon in November. There will be another one in spring again. The registration is open on the SPI website if you go to a remote area, you need to uh, support, you want to learn how to behave if you have health issues, or actually even better, how to prevent health issues and incidences in the field. This is what you should subscribe to. And this is not only open to early career researchers, but to really the entire community. And we are currently developing also with Air, uh, CERMAT a helicopter safety course, which is, of course, very important for some of you that uh, want to go on glaciers, very remote areas where you only get by helicopter. This is something that is co um, coming up in 2023 as well. From my own experience, I can tell you I would have loved to take such a course first and then do my first trip on helicopter. It was the other way around. I survived. It's all good but uh, I can advise to take that course. So uh, these are some of the priorities that we are developing for this next phase, 25, 28. Uh, we want to strengthen current SPI activities, providing some uh, continuity. We want to go further with the well-developed, well-functioning um, activities. Then uh, we expect some new flagship initiatives. So there should be a call again around 2025. We want to strengthen Swiss contributions to international initiatives. And also there is the plan to develop um, uh, better logistics support. So really to build up an information hub uh, regarding commissions, shipping, and so on, so on. If you have any ideas, where SPI should develop more strongly, where we can support you even more. Please get back to us. We might consider it for the next phase um, of the SPI. With that, I'm done uh, with the SPI news and opportunities. I'll go back to that slide. 
Are there any questions, urgent questions? All very clear. Okay, uh, we are here for you the entire day. Maybe it's easier to um, contact us directly while we have a coffee or the apero in the evening. And um, I would then go on to the next agenda point. Hmm. We now will have a special guest with us online this time. And I'm just looking up. Yes. We'll actually have you broaden with us. Um, he is an architect, architect who supports the scientific community. And it's really a really great pleasure to have him with us today. One of his very early and interesting projects was to define, and I'm reading off my notes now, the acceptable net habitable volume for future long duration exploration class missions with NASA. <laughs> and I'm of course very interested how big that volume actually was that they calculated or estimated. I'm not sure if this is what he will address today, the extraterrestrial life, but actually it's not surpri no surprise if he works extraterrestrial that he is also um, addressing the polar regions, which are also very extreme environments. So you today is recognized as the world's leading designer of research facilities in polar areas and specifically also in Antarctica. And he will present us some challenges and solutions for such buildings today in the next talk. Hello, everybody. Bonjour, guten Morgen et buongiorno. Um, I'm apologizing, first of all, that I'm not uh, Gianluca Rendina, my colleague, who um, unfortunately has um, uh, had uh, some, to deal with some family matters. Uh, this, this talk was billed as the experiences of a Swiss architect. Um, and I am not Swiss, but I like to think of myself as a European architect. And I'm really looking forward to sharing some of our thoughts on uh, designing, particularly in Antarctica and the extreme challenge that that poses. Um, uh, sorry. Um, as a firm of architects, we are based in London, um, but over the last nearly 20 years now, uh, we've been involved in aspects of the design of a number of different research stations and uh, elements of infrastructure throughout Antarctica. That journey began back in 2004 uh, with the design of the Halley 6 research station for the British Antarctic Survey, since which time we've worked with Bass at Signy and at Rothera. We've worked with the Spanish Ministry of Science at Juan Carlos, um, with the US National Science Foundation. We've contributed to the redevelopment of McMurdo, and now we're heavily involved in a project redeveloping Scott Base for Antarctica New Zealand and with a series of projects for the Australian Antarctic Division currently at Wilkins and at Davis. I'm going to start, however, by talking about our experiences designing the new Halley Research Station. Uh, Halley is located on the coast of Antarctica, around uh, a thousand kilometers from the South Pole, but it's one of only two research stations located on a floating ice shelf, the other being Neumeyer, the German station. Halley is located on the Brunt ice shelf, which is 150 meters of thick ice, which is flowing off the main continent towards the ocean, moving at approximately 400 meters per annum towards the sea. So it is a very dynamic site. On the screen at the moment, you can see the previous station, Halley 5, which was comprised of three principal buildings. On the right uh, is the main living building, which was called the Laws Building, where everybody slept, ate, and some people worked. And the other two buildings are science platforms, one for near Earth snow chemistry and climatology, and the other one for outer space uh, investigations. So Halley, let's get some context, is very cold. Temperatures drop to minus 56 degrees Celsius in the depths of winter and never rise above freezing in the summer. 
It is also subjected to very high catabatic winds. So these are winds that have flowed off the polar plateau, blowing well in excess of 150 to 200 kilometers per hour. And in that process, they pick up snow and ice crystals and bury literally anything that is left on the surface, whether that's a vehicle or in fact a whole building. Eventually it will get buried by drifting snow. And in fact at Halley, the combination of drifting snow and precipitation creates about 1.5 meters of accumulation every year. So every year, the snow level is rising by one and a half meters. So as you can imagine, even a building, with a, which is single story at say five meters, will quite quickly get buried. The next challenge is that at Halley, there are in excess of three months of total darkness in every year in the depths of winter. And in fact, during that period, the winter crew is reduced down to just 15 people. So 15 people living in total isolation, in total darkness. Logistics, of course, to Antarctica are a massive challenge. Every year, the British Antarctic Survey would send down their logistic resupply vessel at around about December time. So in the middle of the Antarctic summer, um, they would go arrive and find themselves faced with around two kilometers of sea ice until you reached the ice shelf. And everything that was needed for the resupply and operation of the station would then have to be unloaded onto the sea ice, dragged across it up to the ice shelf, where ramps would be formed by bulldozers to allow it to be hauled up onto the ice shelf and taken to Halley Station. The sea ice is only around one to two meters thick and only has a weight bearing capacity of nine tons. So one might ask oneself in this context of freezing temperatures, high winds, long periods of darkness and isolation and very complex logistics, why would anybody want to live in such a place? And the answer is because the science which is carried out in Antarctica is of course of truly global significance. And by example, it was at Halley in the mid 1980s that three British scientists first observed the hole in the ozone layer, which then subsequently led to very significant environmental legislation such as the banning of the use of CFCs. And it is science in Antarctica and the polar regions, which is of course, as all of you know, driving our understanding of climate change generally, and therefore the policy, which in the long term, we hope will save our planet. However, at Halley in 2004, 2005, a serious issue was noted. The ice shelf, the Bryant <clears throat> ice shelf was landlocked in two locations at the end of that red dash line at a place called the Rumples, and at the hinge zone where the ice shelf joined the main continent and cracks were beginning to develop with Halley 5 on the wrong side of the crack line. As a result, a major carving event was predicted within five to 10 years and the British Antarctic Survey realized they needed a new design for a new station, one which would be more mobile so that in the future it could escape the fate of previous Halleys, which had all disappeared um, on uh, the uh, carved up ice shelf. They held a design competition and our company working with a large firm of engineers called ACOM won the competition. In preparing our designs, of course, we were very aware of the amazing work done by other countries in developing their own research stations, whether that's Concordia, the French Italian base, the US at Scott Amundsen on the South Pole, the um, are we based uh, Neumeyer 3, which was in development at the same time as Halley, or the Belgian station Princess Elizabeth. And one of the amazing things I've discovered in my 20 years working on polar design is the incredibly collaborative spirit between nations. And I feel myself honored to have met the designers of all of these stations at different stages, uh, drawn ideas from them, and I hope offered some in return. And I think that is a key message. The spirit of Antarctica and polar research is highly collaborative. But of course at Halley, our challenges were slightly different to those other stations. Whilst it needed to respond to drifting snow, it also needed to be able to be relocated uh, so that it could escape from future carving events on the Brunt ice shelf. 
So our concept was to create a station of modules elevated on legs, supported on giant skis, which could then be slid to new locations, escaping the cracks in the ice shelf. We developed our concept with the idea of modules. Each module is around 160 square meters and has an elevation of around four meters from the snow to the underside. And we worked out those dimensions in collaboration with a firm of specialists in snow drifting based in Guelph in Canada outside of Toronto. Our idea was that all the modules should feed all the activities within the new station, whether bedrooms, laboratories, workspaces, or even the energy centers containing uh, generators, firefighting equipment, water production plant, and so on. However, in our designs, we realized that we couldn't fit everything into those standard blue modules. We needed one building to be bigger so that we could bring together the whole community for dining, with a bar, with a library, and so on. And for that, we created this two-story central module, which became the heart of Halley 6. Here you can see the design model. On the left-hand side, there are three modules dedicated to science. And on the right-hand side, there are six modules dedicated to living. Having designed the buildings, we then set about fabricating them. And they were largely prefabricated off-site so that they could be form what we call a kit of parts or panels and frames that have been pre-made so that they could be quickly erected in Antarctica. And in fact, we tested the erection of the modules at uh, the factory in South Africa, Africa, where most of the cladding and the steelwork was made. And on the bottom left, you can see the big red module uh, prefabricated in a suburban part of Cape Town which caused quite a stir amongst the local community, and one of the blue modules also underneath Table Mountain. Eventually, all the components were shipped on an uh, ice-strengthened vessel uh, to Antarctica on a 20-day voyage, where they were unloaded and then reassembled uh, on the ice. And here you can see one of the standard blue modules with its highly insulated glass fibre cladding being installed onto the steel frame. And then once all the modules had been constructed, um, they were constructed at the site of Halley 5 so that the accommodation there could be used for the construction crew. Once they were fully prefabricated and put, pulled together, um, they were then dragged on their skis 15 kilometers inland to the site of Halley 6. And here you can see the large red module um, being dragged to that site being followed by three bulldozers in case at any time it hits a soft patch in the snow and needs to be nudged forward. And here you see all the modules connected together to form the new research station. So on the left-hand side, there are two modules devoted to science with the furthest module on the left-hand side used as a climatology observatory, hence it's got an upper level. Then there are two energy modules containing generators and water production plant. There are two modules so that if there is a failure in one, you can still rely on the other. Then we have the big red module, which has got the living space, uh, the dining space and so on. Then next along uh, in this location here is the command module where also the doctor is located. And then two sleeping modules, uh, each with eight bedrooms, each room being a bunk room so that people can share in the summer and have a room to themselves in the winter. At the furthest south of the line of modules is this observatory. Uh, and here you can see a scientist using the Dobson spectrophotometer for taking those regular measurements of the ozone layer so that he can continue to check the size of the ozone layer and it's actually positive diminishment um, during the springtime. So these measurements are taken you know, every two or three hours every day. And here is within the main central module where we included a large window to introduce as much natural light as possible, which is then glazed with a special double glazing filled with an insulating material called nanogel, originally developed by NASA to insulate the cone of the shuttle when it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. So providing very, very good thermal performance. We worked with a color psychologist 
to develop a palette of colours to reinforce people's well-being during the dark winter months. And here you can see some of those colours applied to the main circulation space within the modules. And here, one of the bedrooms, as I say, a bunk room, so it can be shared in the summer and you can have the room to yourself in the winter with plenty of storage space, plenty of opportunities for personalising it with your own possessions. And here we see the station uh, in the middle of the winter. So the station is arranged in a straight line perpendicular to the prevailing wind, which then blows underneath the modules, scouring away snow and then depositing it as a big drift to the left hand side. And in this way, using the uh, aerodynamic form of the modules to keep the snow clear of the skis so that they can be elevated and the whole building can be jacked up on occasion to keep it uh, above the rising snow level using hydraulics. Of course, having designed such a complex and technologically innovative station, um, we have then been lucky to work on a number of other stations for other countries. Uh, in uh, Just in the last two or three years, um, the Spanish station Juan Carlos was completed on Livingston Island. Um, for a long period, we worked with the National Science Foundation, developing designs for an atmospheric observatory at Summit Station, which I'm sure some of you will have visited. Um, uh, that project remains on the drawing board, but ready to be constructed when the opportunity arises. We're currently working with the British Antarctic Survey on a new science and operations building called the Discovery Building at Rothera Research Station and on a master plan for the redevelopment of Davis Station for the Australian Antarctic Division. But the second project I want to show you is the redevelopment of Scott Base for Antarctica New Zealand. Scott Base is located on Ross Island um, and it sits in the shadow of Mount Erebus, a volcano which you see in the distance there. Uh, it is the site where Captain Scott first went to the South Pole where Shackleton also had his base. So a lot of Antarctic history is also bound up in this area of Ross Island. The, the base was established in 1957 and there was then progressively redeveloped in the 1980s. But the existing buildings have many problems. They're arranged on multiple different levels, making them inefficient. The services are crammed into very tight spaces, making them hard to maintain. Much of the equipment is very old. For example, the water production plant is now over 40 years old. Fire safety is compromised in multiple locations. Imagine escaping out of this door and having to swing onto this ladder to get down to the ground. The arrangement of the buildings creates massive snow drift issues, which require then a great deal of snow management, including people unsafely climbing onto the roof to have to scrape away snow and ice to prevent them from damaging the building envelope. Scott Base also has a severe climate, not dissimilar to Halley, with minimum temperatures of minus 57 degrees Celsius and wind speeds well in excess of 150 kilometers per hour. Our solution for the design was therefore to bring together as many functions as possible into three two-storey buildings which step down the hillside of Pram Point on Ross Island and are connected by bridges so that the lowest level of the top building connects to the upper level of the middle building and the lowest level of the middle building connects to the upper level of the bottom building. The top building is for living accommodation, recreation and so on. The middle building is for science and for administration, and the bottom building is for workshops and storage. To prove the validity of our design, we took the concepts to the laboratories of RWDI in Canada, uh, where they made full scale model of, sorry, not full scale, they made scale models, which they then placed in a water flume um, and then introduced sand and a current to then simulate drifting snow so we could see where snow would drift around the buildings. To calibrate this, we made a model of the existing base, put that in the flume, saw where the snow drifted, make sure it accurately reflected what happens on site. When it did, we were then able to put in models of the proposals and then see how the snow would drift around them. And it was a very iterative process, allowing us to extend buildings, reduce their length, and look at different orientations of access ramps and stairs and so on. 
And this was the resulting design. Three buildings interconnected by bridges, aerodynamically shaped to maximize the use of the wind to clear drifting snow from underneath, elevated a minimum of one meter above the snow surface, um, then with a series of storage areas located around the base to facilitate operations. And Scott Base is very much an operational hub. It's where scientists will come, get their equipment ready before going out into the field to do their science. And then they'll return to Scott Base, collate all their material, and then send it back to New Zealand or anywhere else in the world for analysis. Um, so it's a sort of expeditionary hub rather than a set of science laboratories uh, carrying out science in its own right. A key part of the design is to create living spaces which remind the residents of home, so uses a lot of materials from New Zealand, but promotes both the rights of the individual, but also a strong sense of community. So with comfortable bedrooms, but also nice spaces for people to gather in a bar or quiet spaces where people can sit in a library. But of course, it's also an operational hub and it needs to be flexible to support collaboration so it can be reconfigured to suit changing science programs over its expected lifespan of 50 years. The construction itself um, is um, going to start within the next year and is highly innovative. The first time ever that an Antarctic research station has been fully prefabricated in volumetric modular form and then shipped to the Antarctic to be zipped together. So on the bottom right, you can see eight modules comprising the whole 10,000 square meter base loaded onto a flatbed roll on roll off ice strengthened vessel. Um, the modules are lifted on to the vessel using self propelled motorized transporters produced by a company called Mamouet, a Dutch company. The vessel itself is also Dutch. Um, and it will be the first time that a whole Antarctic base has been delivered in this way to speed up construction on site. So we're starting our construction in New Zealand in 2023. The buildings will be completed in New Zealand in 2027, and then they will be shipped to Antarctica, where, as I say, they will be zipped together in just one summer season ready for occupation. And here you can see uh, the images of the completed base. Uh, renewable energy is a key part of the design proposal. Currently, there is a one megawatt wind farm um, on Ross Island, which serves both the US station McMurdo and Scott Base. It was installed by Antarctica New Zealand, and it saves around 500,000 litres of fuel per annum, which at the moment, of course, is a key consideration, providing 11% of the fuel consumption of both bases. But this wind farm will be doubled in size to a two megawatt installation. And this in turn will provide 70% of the energy demand for Scott Base, rising to 97% on days where the wind is blowing at the correct velocity. So a significant inroad into reducing reliance on fossil fuels, which is both good for the environment and good for the pocket. And that brings me really to the question, what future innovations might we be looking at in Antarctica? And I think our focus inevitably will be on sustainability, on moving away from a reliance on fossil fuels, improving energy storage, whether that's with battery, battery systems or phase change mater materials, and really providing efficient and reduced energy usage. And there are just so many ways we can do that. Improve building performance, which is more airtight and more thermally efficient, carrying out using smart grid control to really manage the way energy is used on these stations. And then increasingly a reliance on autonomous science, whether that's using drones, uh, autonomous submersibles, or autonomous and remote science installations to collect data with fewer people needing to go out into the field, reducing their environmental impact, increasing health and safety, and reducing the reliance on fossil fuels. And this is where we believe the future of Antarctic science lies. There's also the question, what can we learn from Antarctica where, and, uh, and what similarities exist between it and high altitude research stations? And here we see uh, the Sphinx Observatory on the Jungfrau Jok as an example. And of course, there are many similarities. 
um, our importance of health and safety in these extreme environments, which are also very harsh with high winds and very low temperatures, a reliance on a small community who are multi-skilled and therefore able to manage the buildings efficiently, and a very complex logistics with a reliance on prefabrication, all very similar between polar research infrastructure and high altitude infrastructure. And therefore, my final project I will show you is a concept, a theoretical concept, which we have been working on for a more mobile future for remote science. Small modules of only around nine meters in length and around five or six meters in width, which can be used again for bedrooms, for energy centers uh, as living space. And here we see one of the energy modules um, with a greater reliance on wind and solar energy. Modules which could be connected together with a special connecting module so that they could be arranged in multiple different ways, whether in a straight line like Halley, in a cruciform with maybe a larger central module, or more like a space station with an amorphous form where the wind is blowing in every single direction. The idea with these modules is that they should be delivered in their entirety, delivered on hydraulic trailers so that they can be lifted up and then slid into position entirely ready for deployment, a plug and play type system. And uh, here we see the concept of the modules sitting on the ice. And one might think, oh, is this a fanciful idea very far into the future? And the answer is definitely no. In fact, uh, just recently, we have deployed two fully prefabricated modules at part of the Scott Base redevelopment for a geomagnetic installation with entirely non-ferrous huts um, with uh, copper connections between glass reinforced plastic um, exterior skin sitting on a glue laminated timber frame. And similarly, we are working with the Australians on some support for their ski landing areas which again will use GRP modules fully prefabricated using monocoque structures supported on legs and skis completely fitted out in Australia for rapid deployment. And I feel that this opportunity for rapid deployment for fewer people in the field for a greater reliance on sustainable forms of energy will be the future of uh, Antarctic research. And just as a quick plug to mention our work in space, um, as was mentioned at the beginning, um, we did an exercise with NASA looking at the minimum volumes for an astronaut in space. The answer, by the way, was around 19 cubic meters. So imagine living in 19 cubic meters for up to nine months of the year. It's pretty tight. Uh, for ourselves, we've recently worked on an art project with two artists in Bristol in England and another designer, Pierce Plus, on the concept of a Martian house. And we've developed the design for a house that would be inflatable, filled with regolith and the water and ice that you find on Mars to create its own concrete. So the inflatable structure essentially is a formwork for concrete to protect you from solar and cosmic rays, and which would be entirely infrastructure free and then could be linked together to create its own community. And this concept is really partially to look at, well, how could people live on Mars, but also to cast a lens back on our life on Earth to ask questions about, can we reuse more things? How can we grow our own food? How can we live in a more circular economy where we recycle more of our water, capture our waste heat to provide our heating for our own buildings, recycle our own um, oxygen, uh, ways in which we can be more fleet of foot and much lighter in our touch on our planet to create a more sustainable future. And we recently completed the construction um, of this Martian house. It is in Bristol now and available to visit if anyone is in the south of England and has includes a wonderful but small hydroponics installation to demonstrate the potential of this circular economy and creating your own food. So I think that's my last slide. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you today. I do wish you all the most wonderful day ahead. And I'm not sure if we have any time left for questions, but um, if there are, please do fire them in. Thank you so much, Hugh. That was wonderful. And it was also very, very interesting. Thank you.
What an insight, really super interesting. Thank you so much. There is room for questions. Anything from the audience? Everybody is blown away with the wind. <laughs> yes. Wait a second. The spot base will be dismantled before to put the new one. Um, so I, yes, will will Scott base be dismantled before installing the new one? Um, I wish I wish the answer was yes because it would make our job a lot easier. But no, um, the existing base will be retained uh, in use until the new base is completed. So, and in fact, the existing base will be used not only to accommodate Antarctica New Zealand and its continuing science program, which will remain unaffected by the construction, but also to house the construction crew. So in fact, this coming season, we are beginning the process of making adaptations to the existing Scott base to increase its bed spaces and ability to support a larger population in the short term whilst the new base is being constructed. No, so for a very short period, the Antarctica New Zealand will operate two bases, but on the same site. Wonderful. I think this is really an important aspect because of course the uh, advantage of uh, these modules is also that you could remove them more easily rather than just leaving everything out in, in the Antarctic. So certainly also an important aspect. Any other questions? Yes, please. Okay. Hello, how do you manage your waste and especially toilets? Yes, um, so in, in, in both uh, at uh, Halley Station and at Scott Base, uh, first of all, we're using vacuum. At Halley, we used a vacuum drainage system and we're also using a vacuum drainage system um, at Scott Base. The benefit of a vacuum drainage system is that the flush of a toilet will use just one to one and a half liters of water compared to around um, seven to nine liters in a standard European toilet. So significant uh, saving in water usage and therefore water production. And then all the sewage is treated in a bioreactor and the products of the bioreactor are clean water effluent, which can then be dropped back into the sea because it is very pure. Um, and then a sort of semi-dry sludge which can then be uh, incinerated on site without the need to return it to the home country. So, um, yeah, the, the, the product is basically clean water, which is, goes back in the sea, and waste, which is incinerated. Thank you. Any other remaining question? Yes. <laughs> Not good at catching stuff. Okay. Um, I was actually wondering about the lab test that they did in Canada. Like, uh, do the snow drifting patterns correspond to the experiments that they did? Or do, do you have like problems of drifting snow at Halley Station? So, um, yes, the, at, at Halley Station, the performance, the, the, the scouring of the snow underneath the modules is better than was probably predicted. The consequence of that, uh, the aerodynamic, and the aerodynamic is very good at channeling the air and increasing its velocity underneath the buildings. But the consequence has been that the rising snow actually comes closer to the buildings probably than was expected. And um, one, of the re one of the outputs of that is that um, we actually had to change the orientation of the staircases, which was running parallel to the buildings to be perpendicular to the buildings so that the, the foot of the staircase didn't land at the point where you start getting the dip underneath the building as a result of the wind scouring effect. Um, and I think um, what we've probably learned from this is that you can make these buildings too aerodynamic and therefore um, you get the acceleration of the wind occurring almost too close to, to the building. Um, so that, that was an interesting lesson. I think, I think probably the um, uh, RWDI techniques and analysis has become more sophisticated. So um, we, we don't know how Scott Base will perform in reality, but I feel very optimistic because the um, RWDI, we, we did so much research. It was a very intensive 
kind of process. So, um, and I think that their their calibration is now very sophisticated. So, uh, I'm yeah would have little doubt that it'll perform as as they as they showed. Thank you very much again, you, and good luck with all your projects. We really need them, obviously. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much, and what a pleasure to be part of your day today. Thank you. I would like to introduce now Francesca Pelligiotti, who will do the next presentation, and it will be about the, no surprise, Come your project, please, Francesca. Thank you, Gabriela. Does it work? It's in yes. my pocket. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today to present our project, which is called, sorry. Yeah, the, yes, no, yes. It is called Pamir, the Tyco lead, together with Martin Olse. Martin, do you want to stand up for? Yes, together with Martin Olse, in what is a very exciting and a very effective and a very elegant i feel copy i ship i definitely need i think i think we definitely need two or more pis for such a complex project this is our project it's called from eyes to microorganisms and humans towards an interdisciplinary understanding of climate change impacts on the third pole in short pamir and I just would like to recall very briefly the call we responded to, because this is something that I think puzzled us at the beginning and puzzled a number of other people probably who saw the call. This is a call that was only or almost only for fieldwork. And the way we interpreted this was then, <clears throat> excuse me, was then to collect, to design a project that would collect transformative data with the potential to change our current understanding of a problem of global relevance. And a, a call for research that no other funding mechanism will fund, not an SNF nor an ERC. It was also a call for programs, not projects. So the project, or better, the program we designed was a highly interdisciplinary, a high risk um, project program to address the problem of global relevance. How does PAMIA fit into that? Pamir, this is this region here, will become apparent in a minute, is the only region in the world with growing or stable glaciers. This has been called the Karakorum Pamir anomaly. What you see in this figure from a paper from last year, but a number of publications have provided evidence for this, is the surface glacier mass balance, which is the glacier mass balance for every single glacier in high mountain Asia. Red is mass loss, the glaciers are losing mass, and blue is mass gains, and the yellow is zero. And you see that all high mountain Asia is red or orange, except for this region. This is the Pamir and Karakorum. And by the way, the Karakorum is impossible to access. We have tried, and many other people have tried. So this is the region where we focus. It's a unique cryospheric situation, but it's not only interesting for us as scientists to look at those unique glaciers. This is also one of the most vulnerable basins in the world in terms of water resources. This is a paper that Walter Imagel and Coates published two years ago in Nature, having Walter is in the audience, in fact, in which they assess the importance and vulnerability of all the water towers, the major mountain chains in the world. And they came up with this wall tower index, sorry, this thing keeps moving, from zero to one, where one would indicate the most important and the most vulnerable water towers. And if you see high mountain Asia, the RGI region through, 13, 14, 15 is really a hot spot in, in that respect. And this is the Amudaria, the, the large basin where the Pamir, well, Amudaria and Siadaria are the two large basins where the Pamir is located. So these are very important mountains for people, extremely important. They provide water to a lot of people, but very vulnerable at the same time. So in this context, what is the overarching goal of our project? We want to understand the current state of the Pamir cryosphere. So we don't only look at glaciers in Pamir, there is a whole, and in Tajikistan in particular, there is the whole manifestations of cryospheric forms. There are a lot of traditional glaciers, if I can say so, clean ice glaciers, a lot of rock glaciers, a lot of debris cover glaciers. There is also a lot of permafrost. Tajikistan, by the way, is the country whose surface with, with the highest amount of its own surface covered by ice. So we want to understand the current state of the, pre, the Pamir cryosphere, understand the causes of that anomalous patterns, but also the character of that anomaly. Is it really an anomalous? Where are those patterns anomalous? But also, is the anomaly nearing its end? There was a publication last year, Daniel Farinotti was the co-author, he's in this audience, I think, I saw Daniel, that was suggesting that, that the anomaly might be nearing the end. 
sorry, excuse me, might be nearing the end. So this lends urgency to our research. And then we want to understand, once we understand the causes and character of the anomaly, okay, what is its impact on ecosystems, on hazards, and water resources? This is the consortium that is tackling this big and ambitious problem. It's highly interdisciplinary. Oh, sorry, this is a misspell. It's highly interdisciplinary. There are two PIs, myself and Martin, and six research clusters. I'm going to describe them very briefly now. Cluster one is led by Margit Shikowski, is climate and environmental history. Margit is not here today. I think she's on Kilimanjaro. Drilling an ice core, the goal there is to drill a deep ice course to the bottom of Fichenko. This is an enterprise that has been attempted by many people. We understood after this summer why they were not successful. I'll get back to this in a few slides. And we aim now at drilling two deep ice cores, not only one because Ice Memory has endorsed our project and they're providing funding for a second ice core to be stored in the archive for future memory as a legacy to you. Well, to the globe, I would say. And the idea here is that these ice cores could provide us with an understanding of past changes in snow accumulation, in the origin of precipitation in the region, and in the regional scale atmospheric dynamics. So this could really help us test the two or three or four competing hypotheses that have been suggested to explain that anomalous behavior of the glaciers in the region. Cluster two is mountain permafrost. It's led by Martin. There is a lot of permafrost in the region. So the goal here is to understand, quantify the perma permafrost distribution and quantity across the entire region and pro to provide the evidence base to understand how permafrost will tow and degrade in the future. Cluster three is glacier snow and hydrology. It's the one that I lead together with my group. This really focuses on glaciers and snow glaciers in all their manifestations, as I said. This will provide us with an understanding of the current state of the anomaly, but then also with a unique observational benchmark for models. And this is also one of our ambitions to run models in, in this program, models of climate, glacier, and hydrology of the region. Cluster four is microbial geochemistry. This is led by Tom Batten from APFL. And Tom is looking at microbial communities in glacier fair streams. This will allow Tom and his group to build a unique reference, like a standard gold, because these are the only streams fed by glaciers that are either stable or growing. So they don't exist anywhere else. So they will, they will allow Tom and his lab to understand how those microbial communities adapt to those conditions and how they will change because of climate change and how their biogeochemistry will change and they contribute their role in contributing to the global carbon cycle. They have a, a very important role for that. Cluster five is cryospheric hazard. This is Simon Allen. Simon is also not here today because he's in, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, that cluster look at cryospheric hazard. I said this is really a unique region in terms of the cryosphere. And it is, in, so I could talk for hours about this. I just decided to show you one photo that shows that. What you see here, this is a clean ice, well, this is a clean ice portion of a glacier that then turns into a debris cover glaciers. This is a rock glacier. This is a very interesting um, yeah, transition from a, a, a debris cover glaciers to a rock glacier that dams a lake that is formed by, again, a sequence of a very large clean ice glacier, debris, and rock glacier. The rock, the, the glacier lakes and the rock glaciers, they dammed gla uh, lakes in the region are unique. They don't exist anywhere else in, in the region, uh, in the world. And there are really unique hazards associated with glaciers and permafrost. And one of Simon's goal is to understand which are those associated with hazard, uh, with glaciers and which with permafrost. And then to build together with partner in the region, say multi-hazard early warning system. In this, this region is also famous because of the major collab glacier collapses. I mean, glaciers that bone just fall down one after the other. There are a couple of papers that came out on, on this. Cluster six, this is the history of glacier science. For me, it's one of the most fascinating. It's really across the disciplinary boundary. It's led by Christine Bixel. Christine is also not here today because she's leaving tomorrow to Tashkent. This looks at the history of Soviet glaciology. Soviet scientists studied glaciers in Central Asia starting from the 20s, well, even earlier, in fact. But starting from the 20s, we have archival evidence. And we don't know why they did that. We also don't know, super importantly, what they found. 
And we don't know whether they were aware that they were studying and they were looking at an anomaly. So this is all the stuff that Christina is going to investigate. What Christina wants to, Christina and her group wants to understand, this is, sorry, I, I wanted to mention this. This is the Gorgonov station near Fechenko Glacier, this iconic glacier. Fechenko Glacier is the longest glacier in the world outside the two poles, Arctic and Antarctic. We call third pole, that is for the first speaker, only high mountain Asia. This is a question of definitions, but we can discuss it. Fechenko is this iconic glacier, one of the largest in high mountain Asia, I think the second or third. And this was the Russian station, which I feel is a very moving. This is the outside and this is the inside. I mean, to look at the traces left by those Soviet scientists. What Christina wants to understand are the historical trajectories of the interactions between politics and the production of scientific knowledge. How do they affect each other? Why are we studying those glaciers as well? And yeah, this was just a, a, such a nice picture of, of their station. I wonder what traces we will leave in 20 or 50 or 60 years. So this is the project in a nutshell. It's a very ambitious project. It tackles an extremely complex problem. It's addressed, it's tackled by a team that is very diverse. I think, I hope is also very strong. We have 41 Swiss scientists, 21 Tajiki, and a number of international partners, some are in this audience. There is a strong support by the international community for our project. We were trying to strike a balance between early career and, and more established senior scientists. We have a number of additional early career scientists that have joined since submission. And altogether, we are tackling this very complex system in its entirety. One key element that allows us to tackle that system in its entirety beyond the single cluster, the single location, the single knowledge, is the fact that we are going to use in this project, we are not only collecting data, we are also going to use the latest generation of models. We're going to use land surface model, and one in particular that we've been developing over the years, models that can allow to, to simulate the complexity of the cryosphere, the hydrosphere, but also the biosphere. This is an important element we are adding to the picture here. So this is the project in a nutshell. Where are we now? I mean, September, August to September 2022. Pamia started in March of this year, and we spent hectic months setting up the project, thanks to SPI. They did a great job to help us. I, I don't know if they could say the same about us. Maybe they are not exactly, but we are very happy with SPI. And we spent a lot of time to organize the campaigns. There are four clusters that were able to conduct expeditions over the summer, one, two, three, and six. One, this is the drilling of the ice core. So this is market cluster, cluster to drill the ice core on Fechenko. This really focuses only on one location, this iconic, we have seven hotspots in the project as we call them. And markets focus is only on Fechenko, obviously, on this iconic glacier that a lot of people attempted to, to drill at. We really understood why they were not successful. I think if we managed to be successful, it's only because the SPI runs over four years. What we did was in June 2022, there was an expedition across three of the groups involved to explore the logistical challenges. And we found out the logistical challenges are, are, are big. And the major one, in fact, is related to helicopter and flying capacity, so that together with AATS and Martin, this with the support, the great support of SPI again, we have a plan for capacity building, for training helicopter pilots, having AATS and MAT pilots coming to Tajikistan over 22, 23. And this will allow us then the major drilling that one shot in 23 or 24, depending on that capacity building. Um, what the group managed to, did as, to do as well was to test the, um, the, the feasibility of the, the safety of the, the on-foot escape route to Fechenko. This is, these are Evan and Stefan. Stefan is in the room today. They took seven days to reach Gobunov Station. In fact, just for scale, this glacier here, I don't know the names, the name, I, we are giving names to those glaciers, I have to say, I feel. But this is as large as Alec Gletscher in, in Switzerland. And this is them reaching Gobunov Station. And finally, that some of the latest sensors installed about six years ago are still functioning. So this gave even more impetus to our original idea to re-equip and re-establish the station. And we had the support of World Bank to do this. So this is a nice addition that came from this summer fieldwork. 
months and permafrost. This is the cluster led by Martin. There were no Glen measure, measurements for this year, but in reality, this cluster did very well. So they did equip Abramov Glacier, the, sorry, this one here, um, which, well, they did uh, measure the ground ice content in a number of forms from glaciers to soil, rock glaciers, debris cover glaciers. Over July and August, some of the, Martin's team is still in the field. The plan will be to equip all sites to repeat the same measurements to characterize the, the ice content uh, in 2023 at all sites. Cluster three, this is our cluster, glacier snow and hydrology. I think this was a success thanks to joint efforts, Martin's group, my group, a number of other people. By end of 2022, we will have all the sites equipped with a mass balance monitoring system in place with at least one recording meteor station and in many sites more than one, including on glacier and a gauging station to measure stream flow and more than one at some of the sites. People have been there in June, July and August, Martin teams. Um, Evan Miles and Joel from SLF just left. I, together with Ashil and a number of other people, are leaving in a few days. So this was a massive effort, but I think it was successful. And as part of that success, one of the sites, sorry, I'm going back, which is Kizul, I'm going back if I'm allowed, which is Kizulso, Kizulso, this one here, has also been included in the Enarch COPE network because of the abundance of instruments that we have set up over that. Um, the Enarch is the international network for alpine research, catchment hydrology, and COPE is one of the new initiatives they are launching just now. And Stefan and Ashil are also here, are joining the launch in October in Spain. Cluster six, this is the history of glacier science. There is this horrible war invasion of Ukraine has had dramatic consequences for so many people, also for our project. Because the main archival sources for Christina Pixel and her cluster six, um, and her cluster six were in the Moscow and St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg archives. So Christina had to refocus, rethink her research. She did a great job. I think she has been fantastic in that. She refocused on archives in Tashkent. And she found out, I mean, she had some hints before, that in Ta Tashkent was the knowledge hub for Soviet glaciology in Central Asia in general. So those archives contain evidence of that research from the 20 onwards. Um, and she was there in June without being... So she was there in June and she's leaving tomorrow again. This is where Christina is now. This is obviously outside of our domain. This is very disturbing for my sense of aesthetics. It was very disturbing for us at the beginning to think that Christina would be, in, we didn't know where. But I think Christina hit a gold mine. I mean, these are the, the good things that come from, from the bad things because these are archives that not a single person in the West has been granted access to and not a single person in Asia has ever looked at. And I just want to show you, and I'm done, <laughs> Gabriella, how a gold mine looks for some people. <laughs> this is Christina there in June. We'll see what she finds out about that when she returns in a couple of weeks. So to summarize, this is what we've been doing until now. I don't know how many months have passed. To us, it feels like it has been a massive effort. It has been. Um, what do we expect for those four years? We expect some fundamental groundbreaking science. This is really a question that the international scientific community is looking at. I think it's super exciting. There will be super exciting science across the clusters and once we put everything together, but we also expect impactful, impactful science for people given how relevant those, that cryosphere is for, for people in the region. And so with this, Martin and I, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Can I get them? Thank you very much for presenting plans, but also really exciting insights into the, the field. field work, which <laughs> yes, is really exciting. And I'm glad that at least some of it worked already. And thank you very much for being here also just a few just days before. before you leave. I know how stressful this is. Martin told me I had to do it. <laughs> Martin told me I had to do it and I do what he says. So. <laughs> Any questions to Francesca? Can I get some? could have asked a lot of questions, but I restrict to only one. So the very last sentence you made, impact on people. And my question is, uh, how 
are you um, progressing with integrating uh, the local communities? Thank you. I, ha I had a slide that I had to remove because my talk was too long. Um, Martin has been working in the region for 10 years and one of his a key aspect, I think, of, of his research is really to involve the local people. If I can show that very briefly, if that has not been removed. So there's been just, for instance, one thing that I really like is the adventure in science that Tamira has embraced, or maybe the other way around, these girls have embraced us, so to say. Um, they were really, so there is this adventure in science to form young women as part of this a program that exists globally, started, I think, in Washington State. Um, it exists in Switzerland now, in Austria and Europe. So um, it's training young women to become scientists, exposing them to scientific fieldwork, to some data processing. And we have three very cool girls, or young women doing that. Martina, um, Martina, Pamara, who else is doing that? Martin. So they did that already. Um, we involve people, there's been a workshop as well, I have another slide with the local scientists, we were very, very, we couldn't work in the region without the local partners. It's not always easy, right, but I think to work with the local partners, but we do, every time we are there, we do training and capacity building with the local scientists, for instance. Our project is also embraced by UNESCO, for instance, there are a number of, pro of programs in the region to support for hazards, for water resources resources there is scarcity of water resources for instance so all those large initiatives are very interesting in the project that will provide the science for their adaptation and mitigation thank you very much francesco thank you francesca thank you I It's now my pleasure to briefly introduce Lisa Bröder. She is here to represent Pamir, Julia Schmale, uh, Print Bjorn, <laughs> flagship. I'm very sorry. <laughs> you could also work up there. Anyway, um, to introduce, uh, to present the Green Fjord flagship, Julia is still in the field and hence um, Lisa just came back on time, also just really back from the field to provide you some insights uh, about the plans and also about first field work, maybe. We'll see. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I think it's great to present just after Francesca about uh, Pamir because this other flagship is quite a contrast, uh, not only geographically, I'm going to take you to the other side of the world again, uh, but also we're looking at a region where glaciers are actually rapidly retreating. So it's it's also topic wise quite the opposite. Um, Greenfjord stands for Greenlandic Fjord Ecosystems in a Changing Climate, Socio-Cultural and Environmental Interactions. And of course, this is mainly funded by the Swiss Polar Institute. We have a number of Swiss partners that are listed here on this first slide, but also some international collaborations and um, some are in the audience today. So, let's... Um, we are also set up similarly with uh, six different clusters. Um, as mentioned, Julia Schmale is the PI who's still in Greenland right now. She's also leading the atmosphere cluster. Then we have uh, Samuel Jacquard who's here today leading the ocean cluster. Uh, Christy Diner and Loic Pellissier are sharing the biodiversity cluster. We have Andreas Vierli looking at the cryosphere. Uh, Len Chanteloup, uh, the social scientist, is looking at the human cluster, and I am leading the land cluster. Then, uh, last but not least, we have a great advisory board, uh, comrade of Søren Rusgard. Yvonne Zonka, who I've already seen in the audience, and Josephine Newmont, who's presenting later. So the main question of our um, cluster is really what are the consequences of the retreating ice? And we're focusing on Southern Greenland. Yes, this works, great. Um, and we want to compare and contrast two different fjord systems one with a marine terminating glacier and one with a land terminating glacier. So we have our marine terminating glacier here, which just means that the glacier is actively carving, releasing icebergs to the fjord system. 
And that one we want to compare with a system where the glacier has already retreated on land. So where glacial meltwater is uh, reaching the fjord via streams and rivers. And of course, the different systems or the different ways of delivery from the glacier have important consequences for the marine productivity of the fjords, but also for the carbon cycle, the local climate and weather, and the livelihoods that are supported by these fjord environments. So why are we looking at fjords in southern Greenland? Well, southern Greenland is one of those regions that experiences accelerated environmental change, so rapid retreat of the ice. Um, the fjords are lying at the heart of the socioeconomic and cultural landscape of the local communities, so they play a crucial role for the livelihoods there. But also fjords are the interface between all these different elements of the regions, uh, the cryosphere, the land, the ocean, the biosphere and the atmosphere. So it's really all of the clusters are kind of meeting at the fjord. Um, but for the fjord system, that also means that if we're having a change in one of the compartments, that's cascading down all to all of the other compartments as well. And um, yeah, that's kind of summarized in this scheme here where we have the different fjord compartments and uh, the exchanges of energy um, and constituents like gases, sediments um, between land, air, ice, and ocean. And that's um, encircled by the biosphere, which we of course find in all of these compartments. And then the anthropocy, uh, anthroposphere, um, the humans that are living in this environment as well. So the a bit more in detail, the questions that we would like to answer with this uh, flagship program. And we are really starting with the fjord dynamics and the biodiversity. And the, the question that we are trying to answer here is, how does the flux of the freshwater icebergs and sediments to the fjord system impact the physical circulation of the fjord and also the nutrient supply and the pathways? Um, then the second main question is about the atmosphere and the climate. And uh, here we want to know more about the biogeochemical fingerprint and the contribution of those different uh, parts of the fjord, the compartments that I mentioned on the atmospheric composition and also the cloud formation in this area. So that's about the local climate and the weather. Then the third question uh, tackles the carbon and nutrient cycle of the area. And here we want to specifically look at uh, the supply of freshly weathered reactive minerals from glacial meltwater um, and how do these contribute to stabilize the organic matter that's being brought to the fjord and maybe enhance carbon sequestration in marine sediments. And last but not least, um, we also want to have a look at the cultural perception of the fjord and um, how the inhabitants of the region relate to the fjord landscape and how do they experience the changes that are currently ongoing. All right, this is a very busy slide. I'm not gonna go through all the details, but um, just wanted to show you where exactly we're working. We have the two uh, glacial systems. Here's the ocean terminating glacier and here we have our land terminating glacier. It's in the area of uh, Kakatok, Narsak, and Nasaswak. And uh, similar to Parmia, this year we were really just scouting and setting up. I just returned yesterday from the area visiting for the first time, which was great. Um, but our real big uh, campaigns will take place next year and the year after. Um, and Yes, I will get back to all the methods that we are planning to use in the following slides. So starting with the first question for the cryosphere and the ocean clusters mainly, it's really to investigate the ice ocean boundary to understand the processes that are going on there, the carving, but also the meltwater upwelling and what it means for the fjord circulation, but then also to quantify the fluxes. So. Um, how much fresh water is brought as icebergs, how much meltwater runoff do we have, um, and what does that mean for sediment and nutrient delivery to the fjord. So what you can see here is a nice image of the marine terminating glacier that we'll be focusing on. Um, 
and all of the instrumentation that is planned or has partly already been installed in the area. Next year, we're planning to uh, have this research vessel, SANA, to uh, visit both of these fjords and collect a lot of marine samples as well. So this was the, the first expedition to the area uh, led by Andreas Wierli and um, yeah, in July. So the, his team already managed to install some of the time-lapse cameras close to the carving front, seismometers and tide gorges for, yeah, in order to monitor the carving, the ice floor and the ice cover also in the fjord. Uh, very importantly, they also managed to go into the fjord by boat, which is not always possible. As you can see, there's quite a lot of ice in this fjord, um, but they were able to get some first CTD measurements for the, for the fjord to learn a little bit more about the water masses and the stratification. Um, and they managed to get the first uh, measurements of the bathymetry of the fjord, which is of course important if you want to go into a fjord with a ship, it's good to know how deep the waters are. Um, so it was a lot of uh, scouting for the main campaigns next year and the year after. The atmosphere cluster uh, led by Julia Schmale um, has also been to the field. We were actually in the field together. She's still there. Um, and their main um, campaign will take place next year as well using this tethered balloon that you can see in this picture here um, where they can measure up to 800 meters into the atmosphere by like raising this balloon and thereby learning more about the thermodynamics of the atmosphere, but also measuring a lot of the properties of the particles, the aerosols, uh, and also trace gases. And they want to then combine that with ground-based measurements. Um, so collecting filters and learning more about the aerosol properties, again, trace gases. They also installed a weather station on the roof of the research station here in Narsak. So yeah, the conclusions from the first uh, reconnaissance visit just ending right now um, were that NARSAC, which you can see in the background here, uh, is really a great place to study aerosol cloud interactions. Uh, it's mostly clean, but there is uh, quite some black carbon emitted by the local vehicles, as you can see on this filter that they collected here. Um, and yeah, since they didn't have their balloon yet, uh, all the measurements they made were actually taken by hiking up the local hill. So that's how they collected this nice image here as well. Um, the land cluster uh, led by myself wants to mostly look at the delivery of nutrients and carbon to the fjord ecosystems by rivers and streams. And um, just as an illustration, oops, sorry, uh, we have here uh, an image of a glacial and a non-glacial river. Just by looking at this photo, you can already see that it's quite a difference, the milky versus the clear water. So it's definitely a uh, distinct fingerprints of those uh, different systems in terms of sediment and nutrient delivery. And we want to compare the two to uh, learn more about the role of minerals in organic matter export and also mediating the fate of this material in the fjord ecosystem. Uh, because with that knowledge, we can then anticipate a little bit better what might happen uh, when the conditions change. So I was mostly hiking around the uh, fjord of the land terminating glacier in the last two weeks, and I managed to reach the the river that is fed by our land terminating glacier that you can see on the left side here. Um, and we'll compare it with another river that has no glacial water input close to the town of Igaliku. Um, so I collected water samples from the different streams in the area and also soils and sediments to just compare what the source material looks like and to characterize this a bit more. Um, and 
yeah, just as an illustration, I was filtering the water. And I mean, you can see by looking at the water, uh, at the actual streams, that there's differences in sediment delivery. But when you filter, it becomes really obvious that the, the glacial waters are carrying a, a lot more mineral uh, sediment compared to the non-glacial streams. Okay, as I mentioned, the biodiversity cluster is kind of integrating all of the different compartments that I've uh, showed you before. Um, and it's aiming to analyze the relationships between the community dynamics and environmental change to see what effect the, the changing climate has on the biodiversity of the system. And their main tool is environmental DNA. So they want to kind of barcode who's living where uh, in the entire system. So they will basically subsample all of the samples that we're collecting and uh, analyze uh, the environmental DNA in glacial ice and soils, marine and riverine waters, and of course also in the atmospheric aerosols. And um, yeah, so, so we tested all of these methods now during our first field trip and you can see how the samples are collected on this slide. So in Narsak at the research station uh, next to the, the Meteo station, they set up an air sampling device custom made uh, for eDNA. Then uh, the streams where I was taking water samples, we also filtered for eDNA and collected some additional soil samples around our two fjord systems. All right, last but not least, our human cluster is uh, aiming to work with the Greenlanders to understand the ways of dwelling with fjords. Um, and um, to me, it's always a little bit of a different language, but I think it's super exciting to also work with social scientists for a change um, because the methods are just really different. But of course, it's, it's important to also translate our science to the people that are living there and then in return, get their feedback on what is interesting them and what all of the the dynamics that we study mean to them. So um, what Len Chanteloup has started doing is, um, uh, well, really talking with the people that are living there to learn more about the representations and perceptions of the fjord environment to the local people uh, and their livelihoods. How do it relate to the fjord ecosystem? What are they depending on? What are they fearing might happen and change? Um, or do they actually see opportunities in the retreating glaciers? And the methods that she is using, she's planning to um, to announce a photo contest so that the people living there can uh, take pictures of their favorite places and explain why why they are important to them. Um, also, she wants to do so-called walking interviews i'm not sure i'm i'm using the right terminology there but that she explained to me that she just wants to take the uh, locals to a place that is important to them and just have an interview as they are going there to really be in the place while they're talking about the place um, also she's planning to do some video workshop with uh, schools with students and traditional interview methods as well and she's already started this uh, now in the last two weeks. Uh, the, she has presented the project, found some local partners there and had a test of this walking interview with the fishermen. So yeah, I hope I've given you uh, an overview of the activities of uh, Greenfjord and I will just leave you with uh, a view of one of our fjord systems and Igaliku and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah, it's important to prepare well, huh? Yes, going <laughs> out to the field. Questions? Any question to Lisa? Press something? Yeah. Oh. Um, I was wondering what kind of connectivity means you use to retrieve data from the field and if you face any challenge with that. What kind of, of connectivity means, you know, like um, 
satellite or, or GSM? I don't know what's available in there. Um, yeah, so I think this for the atmospheric cluster, we'll definitely uh, use satellite data, of course, for, for the region. Um, then we'll do um, modeling of the fjord circulation for mostly the ocean and the cryosphere cluster and integrate that with like the, the global uh, models. If, I'm not sure if that was the question. Like, I was more referring at, to or? the um, what kind of um, how do you connect your sensors in the field, you know, on the glaciers, inland? I mean, you, you, do you go there and retrieve the data yes. physically or, or yes. you have a remote connectivity to, to retrieve the data? So you don't. for my part, for the streams uh, right now, I haven't installed anything yet because I still had to figure out what's even possible. Uh, I didn't mention that part of this is also a UNESCO heritage area. So it's a little bit sensitive to, to disturb the la uh, landscape. Um, but yeah, for, for those sensors, I have to go and uh, get the data and also uh, retrieve them before the streams freeze because otherwise they get damaged and potentially carried away. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's theoretically this place is not too hard to reach, but yeah, it's still mm -hmm. weather dependent and uh, logistics can still be challenging sometimes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, again. Um, and good luck with the continuation. So now we make a step towards the early career researchers a very important um, part of the polar research community we discussed a lot about that term yesterday but a really important part of um, the community that contributes to our polar research definitely uh, Amy McFarlane, she is uh, finishing her PhD at the SLF here in Switzerland, while Adrien Verle, he is a PhD student just starting at the University of Zurich. So we do have good continuity here uh, in the PhD students community. And um, I'll just let you present your most important aspects you wanted to bring forward. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. You can all hear me. Yes. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to start by saying thank you for giving myself and Adrien the opportunity to, to present here. I think it's extremely important to be able to address um, specifically this topic about collaborations um, for early career researchers. And I hope that the way that this presentation is set up is that we can actually go away from this topic or go away from this talk and actually talk amongst ourselves, not just today, but also take it back to our institutes um, and continue these discussions, because I think that it's not always um, the easiest topic to address. I think it's extremely important, um, but I think we can really take a few steps to, to improve um, the practices within Switzerland. Um, so I'm going to start by doing kind of an interactive questionnaire with you all. Um, so if you have your mobile phones um, handy, that would be um, really good for my presentation. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our own experiences with collaborations um, and how both with our PhDs, but also with APEX, um, what steps we are doing to, to help our own collaborations. Um, yeah, so I think to start with, Switzerland is, is quite a small country, but at the end of the day, I think that actually doesn't make it easier. Um, so I think it's quite interesting to actually hear your feedback about what you think about um, collaborations amongst um, early career researchers. So if you can either scan the code on the right or go to menti.com um, and then enter this code, um, I'll ask you two questions and I think it'd be quite interesting to, to see what you, you come up with. Okay, I think uh, we've got quite a, a good uh, indication. I mean, I had no idea how this question was going to go. So it's quite interesting that, that this is the, um, the outcome, but time constraints and physical distance and then poor research connectivity. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that we're actually quite a um, interdisciplinary um, audience here so it's quite telling amongst ourselves what that this is a this is something that we could address um so then i'm going to go on to the next question which is what are the potential solutions um to to overcome these barriers um 
and this is where you you type in some words and we'll get like a word cloud from this so hopefully that's going to work yeah so i think um this continues to to grow i think after some time but um feel free to continue submitting um, your responses because I can also share this like the final outcome of this with you all after the presentation um, but yes we kind of have this continuation of of communication and also funding um, so I think that's quite interesting to take away from from this um, like into further discussions after this presentation um, so the two major um, or the top two uh, barriers that we were we were seeing quite often was this connectivity, but also um, time and funding um, going into um, like the barriers for early career researchers. And I actually was looking at some some literature about how to encourage this, and I actually came across this um, this paper about ecology um, from Panel and. Um, this they kind of broke it down into these really nice um like broke it down into these different steps that we could create implement these potential solutions um and i think the uh the connectivity issue is is actually more relevant now than it ever has been before due to the covid and um actually these events exactly like we have today but also other other events addressing this and bringing early career researchers together are providing even more crucial um at this stage and within apex we're going to talk a little bit about this later about the events that we we are planning but also we're hearing more and more from i mean previously in the presentations from spi and also the the available funding that early career researchers have and i think it's extremely important to have events like these so that we can clearly see okay these are the funding opportunities and these are the ones that apply to me or don't apply to me um, and I think it's really important to actually if we don't have events like this quite as regularly but also to have the input from mentors and um, and uh, supervi supervisors for example so there is a certain role that um, is being um, is required from supervisors and mentors with regards to early career researchers. And I think um, another interesting thing is also the, uh, the creates the standards for data sharing that you can see is um, also one of the points here. And I think that is also a quite a valuable tool that we can use that um, to move forward. And I'll talk a little bit about my experiences with this and why actually for me, that was one of the um, most important aspects of my PhD is the side of the, the data. Um, so, yeah, so my experience, so I'll, I'll keep it quite brief, but um, so I'm a PhD student at SLF, and as part of my PhD, I was able to attend or had the opportunity to go on the Mosaic expedition. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details, but there were basically in total 500 research um, researchers working on the mosaic expedition but also the the data sets afterwards so and the um this community is is continually expanding um so i've been extremely lucky and i think ex each individual phd is is very very different and people all students require very different things to assist with their um collaborations um, for me, I attend quite a lot of conferences that are specifically for that expedition, and that really helps me to understand um, the different complementary projects that are within this community. Um, so for, for, for myself and for my experience, um, attending these workshops and having the funding um, opportunities to actually go to these is extremely valuable. Um, as you can imagine, an expedition of this size um, produces a lot of data. and Myself and with a, a team at SLF, we are publishing the data sets um, and they're going to be open access in January. And I think this is an extremely valuable thing is that I'm able to assist other people also working on the data set. So it's really this um, collaboration efforts of um, getting more people involved once the data sets are public to actually, um, yeah, create these, um, these future research questions and keep answering from the existing data sets um, and of course the support that I get through my supervision and mentors um, is also extremely valuable for me um, 
and I think I'm now going to pass on. But thank you for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just to give you another example of uh, experience, uh, just going to share the two main ways that I think have uh, micro operations. The first one was when I decided to take some time uh, to work as a research assistant before my PhD. I got to uh, join different labs in different countries and really meet both uh, senior scientists and early college scientists and took part in my first projects that I could actually actively contribute to and that now uh, as a PhD student at the University of Zurich, I'm still contributing to uh, next to my PhD. Uh, the second one, which is, I think, even more important, is when I decided to join uh, early career scientist associations. Uh, the first one is actually Apex when I was at the beginning of my master's. And here again, got to meet a lot of amazing people, especially early career scientists, and got to realize how incredible the community of like polar sciences is. And to also uh, get into collaborations at this time were quite different than the usual uh, academic collaborations that can be in pretty big projects. These times, those were project groups that were much smaller, created and led by early career scientists. And that is for me a whole new way uh, of collaboration that I'm still enjoying uh, a lot. And in my case, it was mainly through open source algorithm and software development. Um, so throughout this talk, we've been talking quite a lot about APEX, because that's the session we um, working with. And I'm pretty sure most of you already have heard of APEX, but maybe maybe missed the details. So I'm just going to uh, tell a few words. So APEX uh, is an international interdisciplinary organization for early career scientists that was initially focused on uh, polar sciences. But just to be as inclusive as possible, we included like the triosphere sciences in general was created uh, quite a while ago, already in 2007. And the very nice thing that I find amazing is that in our membership, we include um, students all the way from undergraduate to PhD students to postdocs and young senior scientists. And I'm quite proud to say that with more than 4,200 uh, members uh, from all these different countries uh, across the world, which is uh, quite amazing. And just to give you a um, short overview of uh, what are our goals, uh, one of the main goals is to provide in-person and online skill and career development training, um, both for soft and hard skills. So you can go all the way from how do you actually do my first review and how do I get the support for that first review to, for example, how do I go on fieldwork and do fieldwork um, safely? The other main uh, topic is to provide opportunities for members to share the research and develop research collaborations. So that's mainly through webinars where early career scientists can present their work, but also through project groups, groups in APEX that I already uh, talked about. Uh, the small groups led by early career scientists. In my case, I joined, I joined the remote sensing um, database group where we're working all together on uh, yeah, software development. Um, and there are many project groups every year. And uh, you just have to uh, go on the web, uh, website of Apex and look through all these, these project groups. I have more than 10 project groups. And not only physical sciences, but all the whole spectrum of, of covered by uh, polar sciences. And the last but not least, which is very also important for us, and one of the main actually um, goal of Apex is education and outreach, outreach activities. And that's covering uh, so the general public, so adults that are just interested in knowing more about polar sciences and the polar regions, but also kids and young students. For example, we organize uh, polar weeks where um, young students in their classes get to hear about uh, polar sciences and the research led by early career scientists in a way that's uh, great to hear for them. Um, yeah, so APEX is an international organization, has national committees, and we are representing today uh, APEX Switzerland. And so we organize events and provide support at the national scale. Uh, in our upcoming events is the Jungfrau excursion yeah, that you might already have heard about because we tried to organize it before. Now it's going to uh, work. And uh, so it's, it will happen in the first, second year, um, first or second weekend sorry, of November. Um, so we go up uh, to Jungfrau, have a look at the research station, talk to the people there, be super nice. So uh, just 
come and talk to us if you want to join or like on social media. We'll say it again later, but um, also the, the International Symposium on Snow that will come up uh, quite soon where some of our members will be there. Um, and finally, we have lots of ideas, but one that is pretty close to, to actually uh, result in an event is a mental health online workshop uh, where the date is not fixed yet. So please, if you want to contribute, if you want to join us, if you're interested in meeting more early high scientists or anything, just contact us either today in person or on social media or by email. I uh, would we'll be very happy to, to talk to you. And just to show you who we are in Apex Switzerland. So Apex Switzerland was uh, taken over recently, a bit more than a year ago by Amy and Nicola. And I joined uh, roughly a year ago and David just uh, joined us a few weeks ago. Um, so we would like to thank you a lot for uh, listening to us and a lot to SPI for the support we get um, and all the, yeah, just for giving us also the opportunity to, to talk today and represent Apex and early career scientists. Thank you a lot for your attention. And if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Adrien. Thank you very much, Amy, for presenting here. APEX is very important nationally, but also internationally. Also in the IASC framework, we often work with APEX. If you have more students who want to join at the 15, I'm sure we can arrange the funds. So don't limit yourself by, to 15 by these funds. Any question? I think there is just one big message here, you know, if you're an early career researcher, just join Apex and it really opens doors for you. And especially also beyond your PhD or beyond your master. Um, I think it's such an important body to network um, among early careers, but also with many others. Thank you. Thank you Sorry, do you sure. mind if I just add something? Um, so we also have a, a mentorship scene that we're hoping to set up in the near future. So if anyone um, is in the position that they feel like they could be a mentor for early career researchers and we could write a short description about you and put on our website, um, please feel free to approach us for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next agenda item is lunch. <laughs> we'll be back at two and I'll make it short. Enjoy, network. <laughs>